three, two, one. Jonathan Landau, you are the founder of Healthcare Council, which provides legal advisory services that support social, social care organisations with regulatory challenges. An important role at the moment, of course. Welcome to the, uh, to the Care Home Show, sir. Thank you very much. Delight to be here, Simon. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Um, I've been meaning to come on for some time, but it would be useful for, to wait until uh, there's something to talk about. And I think at the moment there's quite a lot to talk about. So thanks for having me. Uh, well, you're very welcome. Uh, as you say, we've been we've been talking about getting a getting an episode uh, of the uh, of the podcast recorded, and I and I do think when you emailed me the other day, I thought to myself, well, yeah, now now seems like the the the, the right time to have this conversation. So, uh, as we were talking about before uh, we, uh, we before we started uh, recording, uh, it was of course Angela Boxall and uh, Caroline Roberts that introduced us. So, uh, thank you both to uh, to those two ladies to uh, for, for for connecting us in the in the first place. And ever since that happened, um, I don't know, maybe uh, kind of four or five, maybe even been six months ago now. Um, I've been looking forward to, to connecting with you. So it should be uh, looking forward to today's conversation. Good to be here. So. Um, for anyone that doesn't know a kind of exactly what it is you uh, it is that you do do you want to tell me a little bit about your background uh, and then also just explain about the, the type of work that you get involved in sure so i'm a barrister but most of the work that i do at the moment is directly for businesses and particularly social care businesses and uh, my area of practice is healthcare regulation um, and there's a variety of work that I do within that. Uh, a lot of my work is advising providers facing some type of a CQC interest, whether it's uh, an inspection report that they're unhappy with or high-end enforcement. Um, so that takes up um, some proportion of my work. Uh, I also advise providers in connection with safeguarding investigations, uh, safeguarding out of what reviews, uh, inquests, um, and really anything on the public law side of healthcare law. Um, so also uh, dealing with commissioning disputes, contract monitoring disputes, um, care home contracts, which, is, which are heavily regulated by the Competition and Markets Authority. So anything along the public law side of, uh, of healthcare law, particularly for care home providers. Got you, got you, got you. Perfect, thank you for, thank you for just framing that for us. Um, so one thing that I know that you do uh, that uh, I know is extremely popular is your Zoom calls on a uh, on a Wednesday morning. Um, again, for the for the audience, I, I know a little bit about them, obviously, having heard from uh, from Angela and uh, Caroline. I'm yet to join one, but Wednesday mornings are terrible for me. So it's always one of those things where I'm juggling a few of the bits and pieces to, to try and see whether I can uh, I can attend. But um, but yeah, for, for, for the audience's benefit, can you tell us a little bit about the, the Zoom course? Because from from what I understand, they're extremely, uh, extremely useful. And uh, I think people get an awful lot of value from them. Yeah, I mean, we've changed uh, recently to every three weeks. Uh, so I think there's no longer really the urgency to have them every week. I think it was, it was especially important to have them frequently at the beginning because it was such a rapidly changing set of circumstances. The idea of it really was that, uh, that prov providers were facing an incredible set of challenges um, with uh, very little supporting guidance from the government. And sometimes, as we know, the guidance that did come out uh, was extremely unhelpful and uh, created its own risks. So the idea for the, uh, for, for the weekly Zooms was to get providers together so that they could share their experiences, uh, share the problems that they're having, but also, crucially, to share the solutions that they might have um, and yeah, they have proved very useful and, and helpful for that reason, that it, it's a forum for sharing solutions uh, to do with COVID. Mm. Um, so we're carrying on uh, having those now every three weeks, uh, but also sharing um, information on an ad, ad hoc basis when uh, new developments arise. What I really like about that is uh, a really big part of what I try and do both with the podcast and some of the various other things that I'm involved in is to try and bring this, the sector together. There's lots of great work that, that happens, but often it happens in, in silos. Um, so wherever there's an opportunity, wherever somebody's trying to kind of break down some of those silos and uh, to be able to, uh, to be in a position to kind of share best practice and things, I always get excited because the, one of the wonderful things about uh, technology like Zoom, how we're recording the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the podcast today, obviously that's your, your, your platform for how you share your, uh, your, uh, your, um, your insights and things, 
we're able to, to create this and then distribute it to, to, to lots and lots of people. And hopefully uh, by, 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 by both doing what we do, we're kind of breaking down some of those silos and just making as much of this information and insight kind of as freely available to people as, uh, as possible. So um, given, the, given the enthusiasm that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, that people have for your, uh, for your sessions, Anyone that's uh, that, that's interested in that, what I'll do is, um, if if you want to share the, uh, the the contact details and things, I'll make sure that they're in the in the show notes so that um, people can get involved in that discussion as uh, as well. Because I know that, um, uh, as I say, the the, the the enthusiasm that I've had from Angela and Caroline Roberts and other people uh, is uh, that it's that it's great. So uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm just very glad of its existence and that you're helping people out in that uh, that way. That's uh, that's great news. Um, one of the one of the big things that we we, we agreed that we wanted to talk to, to talk to about um, talk about today, sorry, uh, is the um, uh, the CQC's transitional framework. Uh, now, obviously, this is the the new methodology that the CQ, CQC is using to inspect services. Um, do you want to do you want to start with the the uh, the kind of the transition from one to the other and just kind of explain kind of how it how it works? Yeah, sure. So. It is quite an important development and it's uh, the reason why I thought I ought to get in touch with you so we can spread the word a little bit about what's happening, what the risks are and how to manage the risks. Um, so it's quite a radical move away from fixed frequency inspections, which is what the sector was used to before. So previously, um, providers knew that they would have inspections at a certain frequency depending on their ratings. Um, instead, uh, CQC is now going to take a, a two-tier approach, uh, starting with a, a triage type system, if you like, and then in certain circumstances moving on to an inspection. So in, in the first part of that two-stage process, CQC will be gathering information from a wide variety of sources, uh, including its own feedback portal. Um, and then a completely new thing, they're going to be having uh, a one to two hour conversation with providers um, based on a truncated version uh, of the close, the key lines of inquiry. I say completely new, it has been happening with the emergency support framework, uh, but it's, it's the first time that it's uh, going to be incorporated into a, a longer lasting methodology. Um, and then uh, based on the evidence uh, gathered through that first stage process, um, uh, including the one to two hour long conversation about the Chloe's. Um, the, the, the inspectors will decide first of all whether they need any other information at that stage. They might ask providers to share their screens and share information during the call itself or otherwise share evidence within uh, 24 hours. And after that they'll decide whether they're satisfied or whether they need to conduct a full inspection. So the big message there is it's likely that inspections are really going to only take place in respect of providers with whom um, uh, the, the CQC has concerns um, and uh, other providers will only uh, have that first triage type and then be screened out. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that, that's, that's essentially what, what, what the process and methodology involves, that two stages of first of all having that uh, gathering information and screening call and then deciding whether or not to conduct a full inspection. So in, in effect, um, does this mean that, uh, so everyone will get the, the call, but only people that they, the, the CQC feel uh, kind of fall short of the, the expectations relevant to the Chloe's from kind of a high level perspective, only then will they go in to go and in, in, inspect? Is that, your, is that your feeling on the situation? Yeah, it, se it seems likely that it will only be the, the, the providers uh, in respect of whom um, CQC has concerns that will have a full inspection. Um, and I think when it comes to the first stage of triage, again, I think they will prioritise those providers. Uh, they, uh, the information suggests uh, need some attention, but I think everyone will have that first stage uh, in time, I don't think anybody's going to be left alone completely. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, in the circumstances, I think it makes it makes a, a lot of sense. Um, I guess there are some inherent risks within 
within that type of a, that type of an approach as, as well, which I mean, I don't, it's above my pay grade to work out kind of how, how to overcome those risks specifically. But I mean, what would you say um, the risks are for, for providers? And then maybe also what are the risks for the CQC and also as well kind of using that type of a, that type of a methodology? Yeah, well, starting with uh, providers first, and I think you're right, as a matter of principle, it makes sense for CQC to target its resources and its attention to the providers that are posing the most risk. Uh, I think few people would argue with that in principle. Um, but uh, as ever, the, the devil really is in the detail. And the question is, how will this work in practice? And what are the risks for providers? Uh, and how can providers manage those risks? Um, so, as I've already said, CQC will be uh, drawing from evidence obtained from a variety of sources. Um, it doesn't look like uh, providers will necessarily see that evidence before it goes to CQC. Uh, they might not have a chance to, to comment on any of that evidence or to correct uh, any errors. Um, CQC is saying categorically in its guidance so far, that it doesn't regard this triage stage as an inspection or part of inspection. So the procedural protections that it has in place currently for inspections and inspection reports in draft won't apply in respect of that triage process. So there'll be no way for providers to correct the record. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously that uh, causes uh, risk to providers. <clears throat> um, CQC has also said that they won't be recording their calls and they say they don't expect providers to record the calls either. Uh, and certainly uh, my experience from emergency support framework calls is that uh, disputes did arise as to what exactly was said. Again, that poses some risk to providers. Um, I think as ever, the greatest risks are the unintended consequences perhaps. And, and I think it's the requires improvement services that are perhaps going to be the uh, unintended losers from this process because uh, I can see situations where uh, requires improvement services are, are actually improving and the intelligence uh, that CQC obtains in that first triage stage supports that and therefore CQC doesn't go on to do a full inspection and therefore the, the provider will be stuck with their requires improvement rating. Mm. And that, of course, causes problems for them in terms of uh, attracting placements from commissioners and particularly from um, self-funded placements. Um, so that's perhaps a, a summary of some of the risks I can identify at the moment. I guess that's... Um you're right that will be most frustrating for people who maybe they have had some challenges but they're they're on the on the up they're they're, they're undergoing that kind of turnaround process and it's um it's it, it it will probably be frustrating for a lot of operators maybe they've got a couple of requires improvements maybe they were unlucky maybe they fell short with a couple of things obviously there's an element of inconsistency with the the, the regulator as of course always there is um but if you've if you've worked really hard to address those things uh and then your next inspection ends up kind of much further down the down the line you can you can be firing on all, on all cylinders you could be outstanding for all, all the customer knows but if uh if, 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 it, if it says on the website or maybe in the future when people are more likely to be in a in, in a, in a care, actually in the care home environment in the front reception and they see that inspection report and they see a couple of couple of orange dots they're going to be thinking to themselves oh, is this is yeah. this necessarily going to be the the, the, the the right place for us to be to be adding to the to the shortlist? Uh, and as you say, that 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 can come that can have a commercial uh, commercial impact when with with everything that's going on at the moment, where uh, the the typically costs are higher and uh, uh, the the uh, top line revenue, of course, is is lower than it would be typically as well. That it's just it's squeezing those margins even more than they would have been be, even before they would have been previously. Yeah, absolutely. And just a, a couple of things to, to draw out from that. Uh, first of all, uh, the same problem uh, arises in respect of those homes that are good, where the provider has invested very heavily to go into out to try to turn it to an outstanding home. Uh, and that leap is, is likely to be more costly, really, because so few providers are outstanding. Uh, that you should really invest quite heavily into making that difference. Uh, and again, I think it's very unlikely that good homes are going to be inspected on a regular basis because the whole methodology is geared towards inspecting those services 
the, the, that are raising uh, risks. Um, so again, uh, an element of unfairness perhaps uh, towards those providers who are most committed to the highest levels of quality. Mm. Uh, and as you say, you know, in terms of, of revenue, um, you're, you're absolutely right to say that there's, there's a question there that providers are going to have uh, to meet because uh, uh, occupancy is, is down generally in the sector. So there is capacity, which means of course that there's more choice for uh, commissioners and more choice for self-funders. Um, so whereas in the past they might not have had the option of avoiding a requires improvement home, now they may well be able to. Mm. Um, and again, there's that, that, that issue of fairness, which is just a general theme and bugbear I have in respect of CQC, that you can have a provider that has uh, really accepted criticisms and has invested heavily in improvement, but then gets stuck with a rating that no longer reflects the actual uh, quality of the service. I think that in turn also really degrades the value of ratings. Um, you know, ratings have always been controversial. They've come and they've gone at various times. But I think if they're to, to have value, that you really need to accurately reflect quality at the time uh, a person is, is reading a report. Um, and if there's massive delays between inspections, obviously that degrades the value um, of that information. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm inclined to agree, to be honest. And I think um, in, in the world that we are, uh, where we are at the moment, I, I don't always kind of lean towards technology being the answer to everything. In many ways, I think it's, it, it's really not the answer to, 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 a, to a lot of things. I think before the sector undergoes a technological transformation, it almost needs to go through uh, somewhat of a cultural transformation. And I'm broad stroking here. There are lots of companies, of course, that are uh, care home organisations that are extremely innovative and very forward thinking when it comes to, to, to tech. Um, but the, the, if there were, the, the challenge could be on some level addressed by some type of uh, well-connected uh, technology that was able to come communicate what was going on uh, from a from a at least from a kind of a high level perspective so that the CQC could understand kind of what was going on on the on the shop floor as such but I mean I'm even saying this and I'm thinking to myself there's quite a lot of gaps in that so it's it's still not the answer but I feel like maybe te technology could on some level answer at least some of the uh, some of the questions in in real time rather than doing it in this kind of ad hoc slightly kind of clunky um and seemingly yeah is it fundamentally flawed maybe not but it's got there's there's plenty of holes in that as well so this i guess what i'm saying is there's there's plenty of opportunity for improvement hopefully the cqc are seeing this as almost like a a minimum viable product for a for a new better way of doing things in the in the future and this is just the first step to what will hopefully be a just a, a better a better way of uh, a better way of regulating yeah i mean I think uh, well, CQC clearly does want to use um, uh, information technology in, in the way that you're suggesting. Um, the, the whole triage of, of this system is based on getting the information uh, as, as far as possible in real time. Um, and just going back to what the transitional framework is, it, it is literally that. It's, it's a bit intended to be a stopgap between uh, what we've had at the moment, which has been essentially a pause in regulation, and before that, um, as I said, uh, inspections at set frequencies to a new framework, which is intended to come into force sometime in the spring next year. I suspect it will be later than that by the time uh, there's been a consultation and implementation. Um, but the, there have been some events around um, sort of early, early consultations in regard to, to what CQC has in mind. And use of technology is, is very much up there. Um, so I think CQC does want to use technology to uh, obtain as much information as possible to analyse that information and uh, for that to inform its decision making. Um, but of course it, it raises its own issues, particularly if, as it's doing with a transitional framework, um, the, the information is used as a triage and then um, uh, doesn't lead to inspections in a large number of cases. Um, and uh, again, uh, 
back to that word fairness, I think really CQC should be asking itself at every stage, um, as well as whether it's something is effective, is it fair? It's a regulator. So it should be, should be a Chloe for CQC really, um, is it fair? Um, and uh, I think there is a risk that a lot of the information comes in and is acted upon, but isn't tested, um, and, and in particular isn't put to the provider. Um, so I think you're right. I think there, there will continue to be a, a transition towards more use of information and information technology. Um, but I think uh, the, the guardians uh, for the sector need to ensure that, um, that, that, that the appropriate safeguards are in place, so that the system remains fair. Definitely, definitely. Um, I know one of the topics that you uh, wanted to uh, to discuss is something that's uh, very much uh, hot off the uh, hot off the press as uh, as such. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll leave it there uh, for, for for you to kind of elaborate on that particular point. But um, I know there was something that was uh, 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 new information that we were we were hoping to discuss today. Yeah, well, it's just come out yesterday, so it is, as you say, right, hot off the press, and it's a new guidance entitled "Right Support, Right Care, Right Culture." And it's the new guidance on the registration of services for autistic people and or people with a learning disability. Uh, and for those people who provide those services, they'll know that this replaces the guidance document uh, previously titled Registering the Right Support. Um, so that's what it is. Um, I think there's an argument to say a better title would be Right Support, Right Care, Right Mess, because <laughs> I'm not sure how much it's really achieved. But um, just to go back to what this is all about, registering the right support was a, a document setting out how CQC was going to make decisions about uh, registering these types of services. And one of the big controversial issues around it was uh, the rule of six. So th this is a rule of six well before uh, Boris introduced it into England. Um, the idea was that uh, services that had uh, more than six beds wouldn't be registered by CQC. The idea being it was thought that um, smaller services uh, better meet the needs of uh, that, uh, that client group. Um, and it was, it was controversial, it remains controversial. Um, from time to time CQC would say that it wasn't a blanket rule, um, but it was uh, interpreted as such, it seems, uh, fairly frequently. And so CQC uh, went on to uh, revise it. Um, and um, the issue for providers, I think, the big issue is that it's not really a change at all from what we had previously. And there's literally a, a black box warning on the front cover of the uh, guidance stating that uh, CQC's approach remains unchanged and the document is to clarify its position rather than to change it and essentially it stands by registering the right support um, and then really the, the, the guidance is, is simply uh, rewritten um, to say uh, very similar things. Um, one thing it does say uh, which is uh, perhaps not completely clear previously is that it, it, the guidance is statutory guidance uh, there was some legal debate about that, including in, in some tribunal cases. Uh, CQC seems to have attempted to put that to rest by saying on the cover that it's intended to be statutory guidance. Um, and the, the guidance itself seems to have <coughs> some uh, laudable headlines. There are four main things that CQC is going to look at, which is uh, that any service has to uh, be needed and um, has to be agree, agreed by commissioners, that the size, setting and design meet people's expectations and align with best practice, that there's access to the community and that the model of care policies and procedures accord with best practice. Um, and there's also a, a section within that about what's called the real tenancy test if it's a supported living service. Um, so that's a, a guidance document which sets out what a real tenancy is rather than uh, something which is just uh, attempting to, to get around the need um, for a tenancy for supported living. Um, so that's, that's what it does. And uh, as I say, the, the headlines are laudable. But my main concern about it is really there's just a, a lack of 
evidence base around many of the things that um, CQC seems to be advocating. Um, and that's there really on the face of the record. It, 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 CQC, for example, mentions NICE guide, guidance, um, refers to a, a document called NG93, which was published fairly recently, March 2018. And CQC really uses that um, uh, to support its proposition that services should be small um, and that um, resident, uh, people should be able to live alone if they wish or otherwise um, with a small number of other people. But if you look at that document more carefully, uh, it comes with a section um, called uh, research recommendations and in that section the National Institute for Clinical Ev Evidence Excellence, sorry, um, NICE, says that there's little published research about what configurations of services and resources provide the best centered support for people with a learning disability and behavior that challenges. Um, and it goes on to make other similar uh, claims in respect of the need for research. There simply isn't a huge amount of research about what types of services uh, work best for, uh, for individuals or even groups of individuals. That's my main concern. Got you, okay. So, um, how, really, how should, uh, how should providers manage the, 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 I guess, the risks around the, the, the concerns, if you, uh, if you will? Um, well, I think there's, there's a variety of things. First of all, um, the, the guidance itself is, is helpful in that at least it sets out what CPC is going to be looking at when they're making decisions about registration. Um, so I, providers should, should look at that very carefully. Um, CQC has included a, uh, a number of case studies um, as examples of its approach. Okay, so you, uh, providers should, should read those and also read the uh, uh, tribunal decisions. Um, there's been a number of appeals against CQC decisions. Um, I've drafted on my blog a table analysing those decisions and I will send you the link to post um, on your uh, your information about this uh, this podcast um, and it's um, it, it, those all of those things will help providers to know exactly what's expected from them <coughs> um, and, and the question providers should be asking themselves is you know can they meet those requirements when making an application and uh, you know the time to do that is at the very beginning of the planning process I think CQC's methodology needs to be at the heart of the planning process uh, I think all too often providers make decisions, uh, then make applications to CQC, uh, get turned down, and that's when I first hear from them. And, and that's really often uh, far too late in the day. Um, so it, it, I think it's useful that the CQC, CQC has set out what they're going to be looking at. Um, so for example, I had uh, one case I've seen in, in the tribunal decisions, uh, a provider didn't consult with the service users about increasing numbers and having somebody else coming to to join them. Um, but that's clear in CQC's methodology that that's an expectation. So it, it was some, something of an own goal. Uh, so I think it's helpful in that sense. Um, I still think in, in many cases um, providers might want to avoid applying for a residential care registration where possible and to go for supported living. One thing which is quite interesting from this guidance though is that there's a couple of case studies around CQC taking action either to refuse an application or taking enforcement action for already registered services in respect of supported living. Um, and uh, to me that seems fairly new. In the past CQC seems to have uh, left supported living, supported living alone somewhat. Um, so that's going to be something for providers for that for this sector to look to look out for. Got you. Thank you. Um, another thing that you were the keen to uh, keen to discuss, of course, was the uh, Department of Health and Social Care winter plan that uh, was, of course, published uh, a few weeks back. Uh, tell me about so what does the what does the plan say? Uh, so 
it's really uh, setting out actions expected of a variety of bodies over the coming months, including national bodies, uh, local organisations and providers. Um, so it, it, it's, it's not uh, what I was expecting when I uh, first heard of the title. Um, it's setting out really in some detail uh, expectations of a variety of bodies, but for our purposes, most importantly, including um, health and social care providers, particularly social care providers, of course. And um, it also does contain a variety of helpful information uh, to providers. So, for example, it, it helps providers uh, concerning access to uh, PPE. But I think that the real importance of it to, for providers is the, the expectations that it sets out of providers. Um, and that, that's a whole, across a whole range of issues. So infection control, collaborating with other stakeholders, technology, uh, looking after service users, looking after staff, really across the board. So it's quite prescriptive. Mm, no, I can imagine. And I mean, why would you say that it's so important for, for, for providers? I think uh, providers might be judged uh, against these expectations. That, that's the risk that I'm concerned about. Um, we're seeing uh, that when things do go wrong, uh, unfortunately, this is not uh, atypical. Uh, providers are often the ones that are most in the frame. Um, so I've got a case at the moment where a provider is facing a, a safeguarding uh, adult review concerning uh, COVID deaths. And that was a case where um, patients were discharged into the, the home in circumstances where the hospital apparently knew that they had COVID and didn't inform the care home. Obviously, that's a, a scandalous thing to have happened. And there are answers for uh, the commissioners and for the hospital. Uh, but actually, it's really the, the provider that is uh, at the heart of the investigation. Um, that's unfair, um, but it's nevertheless what's happening. So my concern is that if things go wrong, um, then people would be looking at the, the winter plan really as a checklist um, as to, to what the provider did and more importantly what the provider failed to do. So I think it's very important for providers to understand what expectations there are across uh, these different domains. Yeah, it certainly, uh, certainly seems so. And um, I mean, what, what can providers do, I guess, if they end up on the wrong side of the expectations set out in the plan? Uh, well, I think the first thing is uh, providers should be uh, not afraid at all to put in the protective measures that they think are necessary for their service. There's been, for example, a lot of discussion around visitors to care homes. Um, and as time has gone on, there's been more and more pressure, understandably, from families um, and also from relative associations, uh, the media, for care homes to open up to visitors. <clears throat> and of course, care homes want that uh, more than anything because uh, they understand how important social contact is because they're looking after people um, all the time. But if they're concerned that there's uh, a risk to, to residents um, because, for example, um, they, they, they don't have the, the staff or they don't have the PPE to um, ensure that um, the, the most strict of measures are in place, then they shouldn't be afraid to take those measures that they think are necessary and close their home down um, to visitors. And for that matter, uh, other stakeholders. I think CQC is a slightly different position because they have a statutory right to, to inspect, but generally speaking, uh, a care home um, can exclude whoever they wish, especially if um, there's risk to residents. So, so that's one aspect. I think they, they can take control of the, the risks themselves. Um, the second thing is uh, I would communicate as early as possible and as widely as possible the issues that they're having. So for example, if providers can't get hold of equipment that they need, of PPE that they need, or if they have difficulties with staffing, which is bound to be an issue over the winter, they should be communicating to everybody and anybody, uh, local authorities, CCG, um, PHE um, and um, NHSE uh, and explaining what the issues are and I think crucially as well asking for specific help. I think then if the proverbial does hit the fan 
um, the, the provider will be able to show that they've done everything they possibly could to address the problem and have also sought help um, and contacted the relevant uh, um, external stakeholders. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. That that openness and that transparency, I think, is uh, is really really key. So, um, Jonathan, really really enjoyed the uh, the conversation today. Thank you so much for joining me on the uh, on the Care Home Show. Uh, maybe we can reconvene at some point in the uh, in the future. But you've uh, you've shared some really really valuable insights. So, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you.